Welcome to The Rig Report, where we bring you the latest news from around the CrossFit landscape. Make sure to smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notifier so you're the first to know any new news that's out there from our channel. This week, we're going to lead off with the Blue City crew, who look at the score discrepancies that have been going on in CrossFit over the last few weeks and how that affects the leaderboard. Welcome to this week's edition of the Blue City CrossFit Shows, part of the Rig Report. And we are talking about how the top of the individual quarterfinals leaderboard, or really the entire leaderboard, is affected by some no reps, misreps, and maybe some misread standards. Yep. Yeah. And so this is one of those things that's kind of come um, to light this after the quarterfinals uh, this year. And it, it's definitely something that needs to be addressed and a bigger thing going forward because a lot of, um, with workout three from the uh, quarterfinals, which had those uh, shuttle runs, a lot of people only did 25 feet for one shuttle run. Yes. And it was actually down and back reps uh, was one rep. So it was 50 feet total made actually one of those shuttle runs. As Andrew Hiller, yeah. AKA <laughs> CrossFit Batman. AK yep. rep sheriff has pointed out, um, extensively. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's just one of those things that, um, just me personally. So when I looked at the leaderboard after, um, you know, those scores came out, I was 198th or something. And now I think I'm like 97th. So there's a hundred scores ahead that were false scores. And still like you've been looking at the leaderboard, there's still maybe 15 questionable scores as yeah. well. So a lot has been done but not enough. Mm -hmm. And it might be, you know, I, I, I'm going to defend CrossFit first. It's like, how many people do they really have? Um, you know, I you, you, 25. Yeah, you talked about Hillers. I think yeah. he, he posted one time he said he's heard there's 25. So who knows? Could be double that, could be half that. Nobody really knows. And they're going to tell us. But um, if you look at it, if you rank the leaderboard right now, just the top, the, the front page of the top 50, just that workout. So um, the the third one with the that we're talking about with the shuttle runs, there's probably by my guess, 12 to 15 scores in there that probably there that are question marks. Do, some of them are definite question marks. The other ones are, where do they really have the capacity to do that? So some of them are more than question marks yeah. too. Like where he looked it up on the guys, I think as Brian Sanchez, no, you know, whatever for him, but, but he yeah. like found his video on YouTube and he only did two, half the shuttle. Yeah. So, he's still yeah, third, very, he's in third. So there's some verifiable proof out there for sure, but you got people that are ranked 800th, 1500th, 1200th, and they're on the first page of the leaderboard for just that workout. So, you know, we're just talking about one workout right now out of five and just that front page. So, you know, everything matters on there. So, I mean, the, you know, I think they've done better this year, mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of like what we were saying earlier um, with, you know, handing out some no reps and being a little bit more diligent on um, standards. But, you know, there's a lot left to be done because this is obviously affecting the leaderboard. Do we want to talk quickly maybe why it matters? Well, yeah, I mean, that's what I was going to bring up right now is that, you know, for North America, you do have 120 people that qualify to those semifinals. But when you get down to those smaller semifinals and um, or smaller countries, continents, things like that, um, you know, Europe only gets two semifinals. So they have 60 people. Um, and really a point swing in that can be so much more significant than in North America. Mm -hmm. Um, or I think of Australia, you only have 30 people, um, and those 30 people, most of them are very, very competitive. So if you start shifting, taking out some of those scores, um, and those people moving up, that can definitely shake up even those, you know, 27 through 33 people, um, you know, where you're fighting for that 30th spot cut line. And even just as a, like a concrete example, people are like, oh, does the 120th person like really matter? Are they a contender for the semifinal and even a contender at the games? And just the quick answer is last year, Bailey Rail was a backfill invite from quarterfinals mm -hmm. to semifinals who then qualified for the games and made the last cut to the yep. top 20 athletes. Yep. And now is a full-time athlete and it's totally changed like yes. kind of her life. So that's the quick answer to, yes, it does matter. Correct. It does. And then when there's this much dis dis discrepancy in there, it really does matter because it's, it's, when you take a point out, it's almost like twofold. It shifts a lot of people and that might take somebody, uh, you know, bring two people, maybe that, that, that the person was in between a little bit closer. It does all kinds of shifting on the leaderboard. When you take mm -hmm. a point out, it's not just like, oh, what does one point matter? It matters a lot when there's that many at risk. Yeah, if you look at the uh, top 120 uh, women for US for North America, um, I think the top like 115 has about a thousand points, and um, 
one twenty five has like a thousand and thirty points. Yeah, so I mean, just can... the sheer fact that you you know, you moved yes. just with the little bit of yeah. work that they did, you moved a hundred spots just in one workout, and you're on the front page. So, I mean, there's a lot of people that could yeah. that could really uh, see some dramatic different scores had they gone a little bit deeper into there. So I don't know if it's feasible. I don't know if that's the answer. It's a, a, a debate for another day, but there's definitely some work to be done. And then last part before we wrap up here too, is just, we were talking about it before we started recording, but just on single workouts, like mm -hmm. a person. Um, and do you want to talk about like how it in competition, Taylor? Like, you know, we have got like, you know, that year that Tia and Carl were like back-to-back -back finishers. It's like, you could, if you had somebody that qualified for the games, that was really good at the double under whatever the workout, the, Fibonacci final and they got in between Cara and Tia you know you could have had like different yeah. results so it just it doesn't necessarily matter that they are an impact <laughs> on the overall leaderboard but just for specific workouts as the person that gets in right yeah so as Teddy's kind of saying if you have a uh, someone that even squeezes squeezes in the semifinals right and they're a strength spe specialist and you've got two people um let's say um like last year you had uh Amanda Barnhart Christine Colenbrander and um uh, Tia all vying for the top snatch at mid Atlantic uh, challenge, but then say you have someone, um, and she doesn't, doesn't do crossfit competitively anymore, but a Colleen Fast, right. Yeah. And she's in there and she can also snatch two ten. And when you get down to it, um, so she's going to be in that one, two, three, four position on the snatch leaderboard. Um, when you get down to it, uh, Amanda, Jessica Griffith and Christine yeah. were all like three points apart, three mm -hmm. points separated them. And so from that standpoint, that was, you know, fourth through sixth place. Yeah. Um, you have a snatch workout where someone gets in between one of them. Someone, and someone's it, out, someone else is and out. And at the end of the day, I think Fisa Gaiafi missed, it was in that semifinal, mm -hmm. missed by one point. You know, so if you had mm -hmm. a Colleen that got the top yep. point, then everybody gets bopped bop down a point. Potentially, yeah. It, 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 it matters. Yeah. A different person More of the games. story, it matters. More of the story matters. More of the story. We got team quarterfinals coming up and yep. hopefully they will, um, you know, be on the on the ball for the for the leaderboard because yeah. they said they said the individual leaderboards are finalized yeah yeah i mean and more important more importantly you know qu team quarterfinals are coming up read the workout description <laughs> yes, because that's what this boils down to is a lot of you know down think, and back is you know, again one yeah down and back down is and one back not is one. not down is one and and halves don't count so it's there's a lot <laughs> of weird stuff going on so new movement if there's one that comes up read how you're supposed to do the workout yeah. All right. Thank you, Sal. And back to you at the Rig Report. Thank you, guys. And make sure to check out the Blue City CrossFit podcast on all podcast platforms. I had the pleasure to sit down with Paul Boffman and Aaliyah King, who together formed the Native Strength and Resilience Project. Together, they worked with CrossFit to bring a CrossFit Level 1 seminar scholarship program for Indigenous people to Powell CrossFit in Arizona, just outside the Navajo Nation. So, hey everybody, we are here with Paul Boffman and Aaliyah King, and they are the founders of the Native Strength and Resilience Project. That's correct, hey. <laughs> and uh, we're gonna talk to them about kind of what why this came about, what they're trying to accomplish, and the steps that have already taken and some steps that they're looking at taking in the future um, where they're going to um, take this program down the road. So first and foremost, why did you create this project? You, want, <laughs> you just let me know whenever you want me to talk. So I can talk a lot. Okay. Well, we started during, um, um, well, we were talking about it pre-COVID, but it really sunk in and that we really wanted to take action when COVID hit. Um, especially with the Navajo on the Navajo reservation, how much our um, our people, I would say our, I mean, you know, my um, Navajo, the Navajo Nation got hit with um, just death. And, and, you know, it wasn't, I think behind it all was had to do a lot of with health. And, you know, it just, um, you know, the diabetes and a lot of it had to do with health. And so that was the one thing that really hit us and we want to change. We wanted to make a change and we want it to help, you know, and we obviously we couldn't, there was no way we could help with someone, you know, um, from, you know, getting COVID or anything, but we could, we, there was something I thought, we thought that we could do with um, 
helping with, um, you know, stop diabetes and, you know, you know, lower the numbers and that. So Paul and I haven't, we've talked about it and then we started to um, put an action into it. And so it was how we started the Native Strength Resilience Project. And, and chronic disease is a, is a major problem in the Navajo Nation, correct? Yeah, there's like, uh, you know, an estimated 50% diabetic or pre-diabetic rate amongst um, the Navajo Nation, uh, the, uh, the members of the tribe. Um, you know, and this is a big tribe. It's a, now I believe the census has them at the largest Native American tribe in America. I think it was 380,000 is I believe it's the most recent number I saw. And so, you know, you're talking 50%. That's, that's a lot of people, especially when your, your average American, I believe is like 12 or 13% pre-diabetic or pre-diabetic. And so, um, you know, and that number goes up with other, you know, like uh, minorities and inner city problems of what, or anywhere that health, it seems to, that uh, means that health and fitness is harder to access. And so... And, and just so people have an idea, uh, the Navajo Nation stretches over three United U.S. states. Yeah, it's, it's big. It's about the size of West Virginia. And so it's, it's not um, including the Hopi na- na- Nation, which is, lies in the middle of the Navajo Nation. Um, it's landlocked by the Navajo Nation. And including that, it's about the size of Maine. And so, you know, you have this, you know, but West Virginia, I think, has around 20 CrossFit affiliates. Um, and... Uh, the Navajo Nation has zero. Um, so we're the closest. There's another, there's three bordering CrossFit affiliates. Um, and we are one of them. And so your first step was, if people don't remember, for the brief time that Dave Castro was CEO, he started a scholarship program for inner city youth where the seminar staff would come out, give a free seminar and allow um, the youth to learn how to be a CrossFit trainer and get their level one certification. You've reached out to CrossFit to have the same done for the indigenous people. And walk us through those steps. <laughs> okay, so well, I, I was gonna tap on you because you actually, um, through, you know, people that I've met through CrossFit, I've, um, as an L3 and as I've been in the CrossFit, uh, you know, the, the, the judging um, portion, as you know, Scott, that's where yeah. we actually met one day. Um, and so I met through that, through Connections of CrossFit, we were able to get in touch with uh, a writer for CrossFit, uh, Joe, you know, I can't say his last name, his last name is blank to me, but he, or, so Leah, we should tap back a little bit. Leah got her L1. Um, and from at the time, what we were aware of, there was, there was no currently other active, or she was the first indigenous, uh, not indigenous, but Navajo, Dene, female level one CrossFit trainer. And so uh, we put that out there, you know, we're proud of that moment. Um, it took her a little while to pass. It was, it was, a, it, was a, um, it took her a couple of attempts, I should say. So it was a really, cool moment for us. Well, somebody saw that, um, somebody that I knew uh, that ended up passing that information along to Joe, who reached out to Leah, and then you should take over. For you. <laughs> and then from there, Joe and uh, Aaliyah started, Joe wrote this great piece about Aaliyah's success of becoming an L1 trainer and her goals to like take CrossFit back out to the Navajo, you know, just to help train her uh the Navajo people and just everybody in general and and Joe and uh Joe reached out to Chuck Carswell and Chuck Carswell <laughs> wanted to talk to Leah. Yeah. And from there it just took off like media wise and it really uh, you know Joe did a big step for us and it really helped us out to get our project going and so he, you know, yeah, he then was a big part of it. And it just, yeah. And then with Chuck too. So when Chuck, you know, reached out and I was just so stoked, like, you know, I was like, Paul, you know, telling him Chuck reached out and then we did the Zoom call. <laughs> they were, we were down in um, Rope, 
Yeah, we were yeah. at Rogue, and then we, we, we actually talked to you then. <laughs> they were... Yeah, I was at a Zoom meeting back at the hotel, and then you guys were out doing your thing with the judging at Rogue, and I'm like trying to hurry. But it was, it was, it was awesome. And I just, it was a moment, you know, that I took as, you know, this is, this is it, this is, this is happening and wow, you know? And so, yeah, it just, it took off from there. Yeah, they made plans to like, Chuck's like, yeah, let's do it. I mean, that's pretty, she was like, I want to be, you know, yeah, this sounds awesome. You know, I wasn't aware, I, I you know, that, <laughs> yeah, he, he, he was even like, you know, he was even like, I don't even know if I've ever spoken to a Napo woman before, <laughs> like, you know, and so he was, totally uh, uh, excited about the potential and possibilities of, you know, what could be done and how we could help, you know, and how CrossFit could help. Like you could, you could see the excitement there with the, with them guys. So. Mm -hmm. And it, and it came to fruition just a couple of weeks ago in mid March with 12 prospective um, students taking the L1 seminar staff uh, at your gym, right, Paul, at Pal CrossFit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right um, here at Pal CrossFit where we're sitting right now. <laughs> it's like, um, a, uh, we had the 12, 12 uh, uh, indigenous, um, they're all from the Navajo Reservation um, or right on the border of the Navajo Re Reservation. Uh, all fully, full-blooded Navajo and one Zuni, I believe. So there was a, yeah, she she came. We didn't know that actually to show, which is totally cool. The Zuni, Zuni, uh, you know, there's Zuni and Hopi tribes are both like within the Navajo Nation or or bordering. So there's all, they're still in just as much need. They're still lacking of the resources that like we even have here in page you know but i mean going farther like your metropolitan areas you, know, you almost in some communities when i i remember when i first traveled on to the deep in the navajo reservation back in college as a i was running truck i remember visiting communities that i almost felt like i was taken back in time to like 40s or 50s and like you know the cans on the shelf and just the way everything was still done you know grocery stores with dirt on the floor, like dirt floors and stuff. And so it's, um, yeah, so there, there's just, there's a big, there's a need out there. And so we saw it, she saw it. I, I wanted to, I saw it too. I grew up in it. <laughs> so, so you're taking, you're basically taking the theory of teach some people to fish so that they can feed the many. Right. And, and so you, you get the 12 people trained. How are you as a project now supporting them to get to pass their test? And then what are the next steps? So, yeah, I mean, it's like, we're like trying to do the whole, that theory, but also like, um, you know, provide the fishing poles and, you know, help get the boats, you know, and like, uh, you know, help uh, let's get the, the, you know, to, help locate the fish, you know, like, uh, <laughs> so we're, we're, we're trying to get a little bit more just past the, you know, just, just showing them how. So we're trying to be there to help support you. We started with like holding uh, weekly um, Zoom sessions with the uh, candidates so that we could help them study and, and go over the L1 uh, study guide, um, help them under, you know, kind of understand the, the, the language, you know, uh, the L1, even when I first read it, it, I thought it was, I was, I had to make sure I was reading, reading the English version, you know, <laughs> yeah. a lot of the, a lot of the words there were, are not necessarily words, but this verbiage and terminology was very new to me. And so um, now as an L3, I understand it better, much better, I hope. Um, and so we help them on a weekly basis leading up to the test to help them get ready and now going forward uh you know after they're certified our testing should is coming up here real soon for them uh to test and become certified at ones we want to help them locate if they don't already have areas to start holding group sessions and hold them for free um we, we will 
on top of that, we want to start providing them with equipment. You know, well, we've re reached out to equipment manufacturers that have interest in helping aiding us there with like leftover equipment from uh, anything from giving discounts on new equipment um, to, you know, possibly donating leftover equipment from events. Um, we're going to be helping doing our best to donate equipment. We'll start with dumbbells. You know, okay, that's how I started Pal CrossFit with, with just a few sets of dumbbells. And so we can do the same thing out there. Um, we cap programming. We can go from no equipment all the way up to a full gym, right? And so and that's what we want to do is first find the space, then also at the same time, increase community awareness. Um, the Navajo Nation is currently still locked down. Um, they're sort of not locked down. I, that's bad terminology, there, but they're shut down. They're on a still partial shutdown. So there's not, they aren't allowing any like fairs or gatherings and powwows and gatherings are a big thing for the community involvement on these reservations. And so second, those open back up. We want to have like a presence there like CrossFit does at the games. Like when you go into Vendor Village, we want to have Native Strength and Resilience booth at the middle of the uh, Navajo Nation Fair, you know, with our L1, with the L1 trainers there representing, doing community workouts, you know, providing uh, uh, information about nutrition and talking about, you know, and, and speaking speaking to them in a native tongue too. Some of the, uh, some of the candidates are fluent in, in Navajo. That was Aaliyah's primary first language was Navajo. And so, you know, to speak that and be able to communicate with a population that's really instilled in their ways, which I think will be tremendous to help, you know, versus, um, you know, me that I can't speak. I can speak a little bit of Navajo, but, you know, if you, if we can connect to people in multiple ways, we have a bigger, bigger chance of bringing community involvement and, and awareness to our project. And then when they start becoming aware that they can go down to this location and do a workout with, you know, our great trainer, Veronica Black, then, it, you know, she can start with bringing people in and start running her classes. Down the road, we hopefully we have full-fledged day-long programs where the trainer needs to get paid because they're, required to be that you know they need to it's an eight it's a full-time job for them now we want to be able to pay them you know and so we want that's our our long-term goal is we have brick and mortars out there to say chinley crossfit or canta crossfit and paid trainers and they're providing free services to the to the the surrounding population that are uh, uh, very economically impoverished with very we're, little access we're, we're kind of winding up on our time for this yeah, week. I <laughs> So I want to I want to I want to let the people know that we're going to follow your journey. We're going to have you back on as more things develop. But I'm going to finish with this last question, and it is: Are there plans to do more L ones and get more people trained? And are you looking to move to different um, tribal nations around the country? Yes, uh, yeah, we are. We do plan on it on have hosting another. Um, an L1 um, a scholarship program here. So we're looking at least um, what- We talked to Chuck, yeah, we, yeah. on our last phone call with Chuck and, and Michelle there, and Chuck even said, and we can double quote him on this, that he will be here for the next one because he missed <laughs> his first one, so. Yeah, so yeah, we do have more plans. Um, hopefully we're looking to see at least maybe six months from now, um, but before the end of the year. And then, yes, we do want to get more um, candidates in from the reservation and then expand. You know, we want to, yes, we do want to expand and we want to go out and reach to other nations. Um, you know, like we said, it's not just directed to our Navajo people. You know, like we, we have um, the Zuni. Um, um, Rebecca, she she's Zuni too. She, she, so she came to the Alwan this past one so you know yes we do want to expand we do want to reach out more and um um yeah extend it so well okay. i want to I thank both of you for sharing the story and um kudos on getting all this done in such a quick time um i think it's an amazing program <laughs> you've done you've done an awesome job and i want our listeners to stay tuned because we'll have you back as more things develop with this program um, just to kind of see where you've grown and developed. So thank you so much. 
Yeah, yeah, thanks thank for having you. Us. That sounds good, for <laughs> thank sure. Thank you. Now we get to hear from our friends at Fantasy Fitnessing about the things they are bullish about after the quarterfinals are over. Hi, everybody. Dave and Catherine here from Fantasy Fitnessing. And we're just going to do a quick little episode here on who, what athletes we are a bit bullish on looking at this upcoming season now that we're a couple parts done. Guy Malajeros is on top of your list. Yeah, uh, so Guy um, finished I guess, second worldwide in quarterfinals there, which um, was a bit of a surprise, um, definitely for me. I think a lot of people expected him to win South America, but for him to come out and uh, finish that highly on the world leaderboard, uh, which, you know, kind of the one thing that got me um, or thought more upside about this performance than last week was just looking at his individual event finishes. Um, you kind of expected him to shoot the lights out on the lift just because the guy can lift a house. Um, but the, the other total, I guess, was his third best finish of the competition. So he was second in event five, uh, and I think he had another event or top 10 in there. So for him to have the lift as his third best finish uh, in quarterfinals um, makes me think that some of those holes that he had um, last year in his game um, have been closed. So um, definitely we'll kind of moving him up my rankings going into the season. Yeah, that's great to see from him. And then next up is Haley Adams. Yeah, I guess also um, from Mayhem here. Um, so what, you know, got me with Haley Adams, um, I guess I can't remember. I think she was, you know, top 20 or so um, within quarterfinals. So um, nothing spectacular from her there. I think just having a, a five event competition, having a sole strength peak definitely hurts her since she's not the strongest athlete there. But um, from Haley Adams last year on the 4RM uh, front squat, which was the strength event in quarterfinals, I think she was about you know 517th, whereas in the other total, this year, she was 261st. So basically just chopping that score in half um, just shows that she's continuing to improve her strength. So while she's never going to be that, you know, elite strength athlete, having that progress will give her, you know, instead of a, a 14th in event with a heavy clean, it might be a 10th. Or um, when the, it is that 1RM strength event at the Saturday night, um she's getting, you know, a couple of spaces higher. And so over the course of the CrossFit games, um, when there is those, you know, handful of strength events, if she can get an extra five, 10 points in each of those events, um, that could be the difference from fourth in a podium spot or fifth from fourth. So just depending on how the events play out, you know, she's going to, you know, be in the top three in a running event. But if she's able to, you know, grind out, a, you know, an extra 10, 15 points every time there's a heavy barbell, um, that's going to make a huge difference for her over the course of four days. Yeah, that's going to make like a massive difference for her. And it's interesting just seeing all the other um, females come out of the team divisions and they can all lift a lot. It's kind of interesting to see that Haley Adams was sort of the first one to come out of the team division. And that's actually one of her weaknesses. So, yeah. And like when you stack her up against kind of that, whatever, the behind Tia group. So you got uh, Kara Saunders, Gabrielle Magala, Laura Horvath, Mallory O'Brien, um, Brooke Wells, like all of them can lift a ton. So like she is kind of on the other end of the athletic spectrum compared to all those athletes. So depending on how the chips fall with the programming, um, you know, she's going to beat all of them in a running event. So if she can eke out a few points um, on the lifts compared to the past years, it could be the difference from her of getting on the podium. Oh, 100 percent. And then a little European action here with Solvig's surrogate daughter. Yeah, so uh, she was eighth place finisher in um, Europe. Uh, so it d good to see her kind of top 10, which is who will see advance the game. So, um, you know, if all everything holds, um, we'll see her in Madison. But uh, she's someone that, you know, I highlighted back in our, our pre open podcast. Um, you know, she was a third place finisher um, on Team Goad at Wadapalooza on the team. So that was behind Team Krager and um, Mayfem. So, you know, a couple elite teams there. 
Uh, and she did win that Madrid CrossFit Championship in the fall. So um, she seems to be, you know, hitting her stride, um, obviously having the best season. But she also is training with um, out of with a program with um, Megala and Jacqueline Dahlstrom, who were also top 10 in um, Europe for quarterfinals as well. So again, like to see you know, three training partners um, hitting their stride, um, being in the top 10. Um, you know, hopefully she's able to uh, make that game's appearance after semifinals. Yeah, that'd be fun to see another daughter in the mix. And then Willie Georges. Yeah, so Willie Georges, so he was second in Europe in quarterfinals as well, um, behind BKG, uh, and was seventh in the Open in terms of European men athletes as well, um, with I think BKG and Koski were the only games athletes from last year to beat him in the open. So um, it's good to see him come back. He was also out last year with a shoulder. So um, again, having, you know, a full year to, to strengthen rehab definitely shows, you know, with his performance there. Uh, and I like, you know, just him coming back. I think the, the European men's field is wide open. Uh, I think with, I think there was only four games athletes that finished in the top 10 of quarterfinals. Uh, and just, you know, that trio of, you know, Upnix and uh, Henrik Hapnelainen and Andre Hude, um, who were all, I think they're all top 20, or top 25 at the games last year. They've, you haven't really shown me that they're uh, taking that next step this year. So with the European field completely wide open for those 10 spots, I think, uh, I should say seven spots. I think BKG, Koski, and uh, Lazar Duchik are, are probably going to be your for sure things as for sure as um, CrossFit can be. Um, you know, Willie George is just based off his performance so far this season. He's probably uh, at the top of the pack for those remaining seven spots. Yeah, it'll be fun to watch. Yes, that European men's field is, there's lots of names in the mix. Let's just see who comes out on top. Yeah, and it being an in-person competition this year, I, I think, you know, if last year's competitions were in person, I'm not sure we would see the same 10 men make it to Madison. So, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see who's in the mix this year. Yeah, that's a really good point. Actually, we're switching to both being in person. So exciting. Yeah. All right. So I think that's all for this week. So go have some fun fitnessing and make sure you give us a follow on Instagram at Fantasy Fitnessing. And our semi-final games are going to be announced via email. If you have an account at fantasyfitnessing.com, we will send that out to you right away so you won't miss any of the fantasy games for the semifinals. Make sure that you're logged in there. So, yeah, have fun fitnessing. Thanks, everyone. Make sure to check out Fantasy Fitnessing's podcast right here on this YouTube channel and where you listen to your podcasts. We finish up this week with my editorial comments on what has been happening with CrossFit and the leaderboard. In 2011, I found a sport that I loved. In 2014, I began volunteering so I could be a bigger part of this sport. In 2019, I started a podcast which turned into a media company, which is now the news show you're listening to today. I love this sport. It saved my life. It gave me a passion that I never thought I could have again this late in life. And while I love this sport, it pains me to see what's going on with CrossFit over these past few months. When changes were made at the top, I truly believed that it would be for the better. Letting Dave Castro go, Bringing on Eric Rosa, I thought these things would take CrossFit into the next generation of it being an amazing sport. But right now, it's not. They are tripping over themselves, it's an embarrassment, and they're acting like buffoons who aren't using logic and common sense to make rulings. This started with Annika Greer, who completed the quarterfinals in the time that was designated. She has complete proof of that submitted her score, and it did not take. She contacted CrossFit 15 minutes after the deadline, and they have given her a hard no ever since, saying that is the rule, and that is strict. We then look at videos that have been up on the internet 
where you can see that people aren't even completing their muscle ups. They aren't completing their pistols. And those things are giving a penalty where it's not, it is not taking away that athlete season, but penalizing them a little bit, even though they did not meet the standard of the movement, which is what defines who the fittest on earth are. Then you take it a step further with the shuttle run controversy. During the shuttle run controversy, many athletes did not complete the number of shuttle runs prescribed as Blue City CrossFit talked about early on in this episode. CrossFit made a statement about the shuttle run controversy, which I am dumbfounded about and cannot understand at all. And I got this statement from the morning chalk up and it says, First, it is important to note that we are continuing to review this situation, but we are confident that any potential erroneous scores will not affect the athletes who are qualified for semifinals. What, what confidence has CrossFit earned to believe this statement? Before the statement was even released, other analysts had proved that this was not the case at all. They go on to say, the average, the average across regions shows that it would require 70% of submissions between the qualifying athlete and the next viable runner-up to be erroneous to re result in a change of position. In North America alone, there were over 2,800 women athletes and 3,400 men. And 70% of those are 1,960 women, 2,380. That's a lot of athletes that would completely jack up the leaderboard if things were done incorrectly. I am sure that less than 70% will do the same. And again, analysts have already proven that it actually does make a difference um, and at a far less number than 70%. All this to say, why pick and choose what rules to enforce? Why one and not the other? And the rule you choose is a technicality and takes away an, a young athlete's season completely. The other is a broken rule that shows the lack of ability to do that movement to its full standard. And you let that go on and those people get to go on to semifinals and the games. You look like buffoons, CrossFit. This doesn't make sense. You pick one rule to enforce and not another. Why can't we come to the conclusion of either enforcing all the rules or understanding that there are circumstances that can arise that affect an athlete and that they need to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. This is ridiculous. I implore you to get some consistency in how you're ruling on this. It doesn't mean it has to be done with a firm hand. It means that you look at each case on its, on its merits and on its value. We need this sport to survive. I love this sport. I want to I want to cover it for many years to come. And I think others would love it if there was some consistency along with the ruling on these matters. Do better CrossFit. I know you can. Well, that's all for this week. Make sure to smash that like button and subscribe to the channel. Hit the notifier so you're the first to see new content released on this channel. See you next time on The Rig Report. Thank <laughs> you.